Hi everybody, welcome to the Age of Quarantine. I am David Castillo from St. Vitus Bar. You can follow the bar obviously here at St. Vitus Bar. You can follow me at Confines World. I'm being joined today by an awesome friend and an incredible artist, Shari Vary, AKA Void Vision. Um, started seeing Shari a while back, uh, kind of hanging around the, the, the weird scene and back at Home Sweet Home, my best friend Nikki was a big part of that, then ended up doing Nothing Changes, and Sherry's a big part of that scene, and uh, really was uh, a New York City artist that opened my eyes to a lot of different music and, and different aspects of the local scene. So, Sherry's here, we're gonna hook her up, and let's see what is up. Cheers, guys, TGIF. We're waiting for Shari, waiting for Shari. Hello. <laughs> hey, Shari, how are you? I'm good. I ha Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you fine, for sure. Uh, we're, cool. we're in the studio. We're in the, the synth cave. <laughs> yes. I felt if I was going to do uh, an interview, I should be in my element. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm here, you know, in my, my little room where I make music and I mean, work on St. Vitus, whatever that means nowadays, uh, you know, and just, you know, taking care of stuff. I want to, thanks for joining me, us, all over the internet to uh, do this. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen so many of these, but basically we just go through the musical history of you as a person, starting from from when you're like a kid, you know? So did you grow up in the, in the Philly area? Where did you grow up? I did. Um... I grew up around a little outside of Philly, um, but then I have lived here ever since college. So um, I guess I'm a true Philly girl now. <laughs> yeah, it's got it, that, got it. so it's actually funny that you introduced me as a New York artist because a lot of people actually think I'm from around there because I've played so much there. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it, I guess I, I I said that, and I realized that I kind of fibbed a little bit. Because I do know that you're from there, but I associate you so much, at least, you know, I think my experience of knowing you, too, really started around that sort of weird sort of scene in, in, in New York as well, too. So that's me projecting. So I'm projecting. <laughs> yeah. um, so you grew it up feels... in and around the Philly area, right? Um, yeah. And... When you were a kid, what were kind of like the, your earliest memories of just being attracted to music and being like, oh, that's that's a thing that I love? <laughs> yeah, it started really, really young for me. Um, obviously, I don't know. But the first thing I started with was playing the piano uh, around eight, eight, I believe. And um, yeah, I've just, I remember music from the time I was a kid because my mom was very much into music my dad was really obsessed with classical music and that was pretty much all he ever played um but my mom was into a lot more with like rock and experimental stuff she actually likes a lot of weird things which is cool um she's pretty open <laughs> but then around age by age 10 i started writing my own compositions on the piano and then around 12 is when I really started getting obsessed with electronic music. Um, I just remember always being gravitating towards any kind of dance song or electronic song I would hear on the radio. And um, I had an older brother who, he's about five years older, um, who was always listening to electronic music like Nine Inch Nails and stuff. So I really got into that. <laughs> and yeah. So kind of easy to kind of do that. There's always that like key influence, right? Like like your mom being and your father being mm -hmm. into classical music and things of that nature. It's always interesting because I feel like in a way, like if you got like lessons or like you get handed a guitar early in life and stuff like that, you're not really like making those choices so much, but they're put in front of you to yeah. like either embrace them or not, right? So for you, did you kind of feel like an attraction to piano right away? Was it like, yeah. ooh, I do I like this? Or is it like, fuck practice, we want you to be a well-rounded person or something? 
No, my parents weren't like that at all. I mean, they exposed me to a lot of music, but I asked my mom for piano lessons when I was about seven or eight because I just, we had one sitting in my house and it was my grandmother's piano and I, w I was just very curious about it. So I immediately wanted to know how to play it. Um, I did, the lessons were a little tedious. They were kind of hard for me because I was really shy when I was young. But... Um, I really loved it. And then after a couple of years of lessons, I kind of quit and then started teaching myself and um, just started challenging myself to get better and better. And, but I really started with electronic music around a young age, around age 12. Um, Cause my brother introduced me to like my first tracker program or um, I used to just watch him all the time, learn from him. And I was just, the annoying little sister that followed him around. <laughs> ah, nice. But that's that's it's such an amazing thing that you were exposed to that at such a young age and that that became the trajectory that you followed. So were you ever like in bands or anything like that? Or has it always been kind of this this mission like on your own? I mean, I know that at one point you were playing with Hayden, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really funny because I did try to have bands when I was younger, but from a really young age, I knew that I wanted to be solo because I just knew I was never going to find anybody who was on the same page with me. Like, I, I kind of grew up out in the country, and it's funny because whenever I hear Trent Reznor talk about his upbringing, it reminds me so much of myself because he kind of grew up out in the middle of Pennsylvania and was, like, isolated from culture, and I felt Similarly, like I didn't have even my best friends weren't into any of the things I was into and um, I just didn't feel like I could relate to anybody so I kind of resolved that I was gonna be so but I did have a couple bands um, that I tried to be in. <laughs> a couple one or two in high school that were kind of just joke bands college when I went to the city I I did play with other people but I was always just pissed off I, I never felt like anything that I was writing was translating into what I wanted it to be. And I, I realized quickly that like, you know, instruments like guitar, drums, they were all just drowning out all the electronics and I, it was just turning into a rock band and I'd get pissed off. <laughs> yeah, cause you just like, hey, I want this sort of element. Yeah. Flourish. I mean, for me, it's sort of been the opposite. I've been bands for my whole life and for the first time with confines, I'm by myself, and it's like kind of trippy. It's a little weird. It's it's different yeah. for me. Um, but it's nice but that's just the way it. that I learned <laughs> how to play music. You know, it's mm. just a different different vibe. So, so when you were um, like in that, so you said you were starting to write your own compositions around ten or eleven, just on piano and stuff like that. You said your your brother was working on uh, on a couple of Dawes and and stuff like that. So were you kind of early on, kind of recording a lot of your stuff stuff yourself and like kind of thinking about things in that way? Yeah, I mean, I started, I, I was basically using this program where, you know, it wasn't even like a, a straightforward program for a beginner because, I mean, I guess I think most people start easier where they're just recording track by track, but this was like a tracker program where you're basically programming letters and numbers to make the sound you want. So it kind of like I started off on level two instead of level one, <laughs> but oh, wow. yeah, and I did. I do have a lot of those early experiments, which is interesting because at the time I wasn't, you know, before you know formal structure of music and you don't know what you're doing, you kind of just lay a bunch of things on top of each other. And um, it took me a while to figure out song construction, but I kind of like the early shit I did. It almost sounded like coil. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it is cool to go back nope. and, and listen, right? <laughs> when you don't know yeah. sort of what you're doing or at different times, maybe you thought you knew what you were doing, right? And then you're like, oh, wait, no, I really didn't. And, and as you kind of keep going through those sorts of progressions, but sometimes the naivete can lead to really cool experiments yeah. and just like interesting moments and stuff like that is that what you're kind of discovering there yeah i kind of sometimes wish i didn't know the formal rules again so that i can go back into that 
that naive darkness where I'm just fumbling around because it can be really interesting. But yeah, and like, sometimes it's good to kind of like try and do things to unlearn that a little bit, you know, like <laughs> fuck, like fuck with yourself a little bit. Yeah, I, I have done that <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah. It's it's interesting trying to put yourself in a state of mind when you write, and and that's why I kind of like having a certain atmosphere in my studio when I'm trying to record or write or like, you know, you have to be in the right state of mind to really come up with things sometimes. And if you're just working from a sterile environment, it, it's very uninspiring. <laughs> you know? Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, for me, it's kind of sort of the same you know uh just kind of learning how to do things on my own and you know in the context of a band it's like you go to this space you 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 where, where you're allowed to play loud and yeah. then th that's cool now like, here now i have like a room i painted it this beautiful burgundy i'm like i'm trying to get into those modes as well yeah um, I, I dress I, up sometimes when i'm just writing just to like play a character or something <laughs> sure sure so when you were kind of starting to compose and like you were saying, you're like, I kind of didn't really know what the fuck I was doing as we all don't at like the, the youngest of ages and stuff of that nature. Um, when like, obviously, okay, so Big Bro is kind of into industrial, it seems like Nine Inch Nails and surrounding groups and things like that. When, what, when did you start kind of, um, kind of formulating kind of more of your your thoughts on synths and things of that nature and kind of the sound that you would start to inhabit as Void Vision. Yeah, well, I mean, not, not to keep going back to Nine Inch Nails, but they really kind of were the first thing that made me realize that anything could be music and it didn't have to be an instrument. And, you know, I got really interested in like sampling and, um, and then I kind of, from there, dug backwards more into the 80s stuff. Uh, you know, Depeche Mode and Cabaret Voltaire, like more experimental things. And but yeah, I kind of I started there and worked backwards, and I read a lot of biographies and things. But yeah, it was it was hard trying to figure out what my sound would be exactly. And I feel like the second I knew what I liked, and then one day I heard one of the first artists on Weird Records, which as Opus Finis, <laughs> and I, um, I emailed, I messaged him on MySpace, and I was just like, how are you making these sounds? Because I was very surprised that it was new music, and, mm. you know, because it sounded like it came from a different decade, and I was like, this is the shit I love, but, and I knew about electronic music, computer music, but I wasn't really super versed in the ins and outs of vintage synthesizers and the whole process so like I was still exploring it I was in my like late teens early 20s I guess um but then I you know then I started investing in my own gear well I met Hayden and we we played in a band together and we actually had a drummer a bass player and Hayden was on guitar <laughs> and then he um switched over to synths and programming and I was playing synths and doing vocals and he and I just kind of realized we were on the same page and we just decided to go on go forward as a duo and I you know around the early 20s is, I mean I had written songs before that but it was hard for me to get them in the form that I wanted them to be in and how I imagined them until I started really researching and playing with different sense and trying to like learn the whole history of them and figure it's like you really the instrument can inform your sound so much and you really have to learn how to use them well to get that picture in your head to come out right yeah no absolutely and I think that that's something really uh you know interesting obviously we've had all sorts of musicians on 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 the show and stuff like that and we had uh Andrew Drab Majesty Andrew and, and he was talking <laughs> a lot of, you know he plays a lot of guitar in, in in his stuff and like very like you know arpeggiated kind of guitar and mm -hmm. stuff and he, he started talking a little bit about he worked at this guitar store and then he learned from a friend who worked at like a synth store and that was like a friend that really opened his mind to some of the the, the kind of textures and things like that that would go on to in, inform his work 
So for you, it was like, yo, I'm listening to new music, but it sound, it, it really had the, the integrity of a lot of the things that you loved. And that's how you started to, to dive in. What was like the first piece of equipment, do you think, or gear where you started to really like connect with it in that deeper way where you're like, oh, I'm starting to like, get yeah that's what i've been trying to what would that that exciting moment where you're like yo that's what i've been here well it's really hard to pick a specific piece but i mean when i first started i was kind of working a lot with computers when i was younger and you know i, I was a kid and didn't really have much money to invest in physical sense and the first one or two i got were like digital sense but they weren't you know that special or anything <laughs> but they were good to learn on and then when I was with you know Hayden working with him I started to invest more in like old sense and I, I guess the first real amazing one I got was my Roland SH 101 and that one really uh I love and I'll never get rid of <laughs> but um yeah, I mean, that's just a classic one. And when I got that, it kind of opened up my world a lot. And now, now I have a, a shitload of crap, so. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And that's, you know, I mean, I guess that's that's the thing, too. Once you start, you kind of can't stop, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like, so funny. But the thing is, is like every synth is so different. And um, they all have their limitations and their, their things that they do well and their flaws. And then they all have, like, a role to play in the tapestry you know they, they fit in a different sound keys and it's it's you really have to learn them to figure out which one you need to use for which role you know? totally i think that that's very key too it's almost like you're casting different members in a band or something as well you're like this this one's really good at this this one's really good at that i'm, I'm putting different things together in order to to orchestrate what what you really are arriving at and that there's a lot of nuance in this people there's a lot of yeah. homework nuance like you were saying <laughs> all of this. And and, i mean i i hardly know anything comparatively <laughs> to folks that have been working on this for however many years you know um so after you were four piece kind of void vision and stuff like that i think i saw that iteration by the way i'm not i might i'm not exactly <laughs> sure i hope but not. Uh, I think the most the, the most memorable iteration, though, at least what I really remember, it was when you and Hayden. It was just you two. I saw you guys at, at Weird, and and it was it was great. And then I had the seven inch, and I, it just kind of started from there. I mean, obviously, you. What was it like when you started first getting some attention from like Mannequin and Blind Prophet and stuff like that, and you started recording a couple of seven inches? What, what was that sort of like time period like? Because I feel like that's when you started to really flourish and started to to work with a, a lot of artists in in that sort of weird slash minimal synth scene that ended up oddly kind of blowing up for a hot second. Yeah, there. it's crazy what it's become. Um, that was really an amazing part of my life that I won't forget. Um, it was a lot, of, there was just an energy and like a lot of momentum. And um, I felt finally validated for the first time when Peter's school kind of get, showed me support and um, the weird record scene became kind of my family. So it was, it's interesting because as much as I've worked solo, enjoy working so well. I've always wanted that sense of family and community. Um, so I felt like I had finally found it and it was just very, very rare um, <laughs> as the slogan goes. But yeah, it was, it was really, um, there was just a lot of enthusiasm in New York that I wasn't receiving in Philly because I was kind of like a fish out of water in Philly. There was no other electronic musician around here it's mostly like indie and garage rock and um i was just kind of miserable here so when i went to new york i felt like people finally understood what i was doing and the type of music i was making and they actually appreciated it and it, it's nice when people enjoy something that you put all your time and passion into <laughs> yeah so. for sure i mean and also just finding those other like-minded people and then all of a sudden 
things start to sort of happen, like you said, with Peter, you, you got that, that first inkling of support. And obviously, for, for people watching this who might not know, a great place to start is uh, Weird Records put out a couple of compilations on Minimal Synth that were, were really, like, incredible. And uh, I think that that kind of informs a lot of what... Um, uh, what Charity sort of talking about, and then put out a lot of more contemporary stuff in, in that, in that sort of vein. So, um, when did you start? Uh, when did you and Hayden start to decide to part ways, and then Void Vision would start to become just yourself? Yeah. So that was um, kind of sudden, <laughs> but I think he just really needed to go off and do his own thing, which is, you know, sometimes people need that. Um, it was right, right after we put out the seven inch. Um, yeah, I think then was when we split, and then I, I almost felt like I was gonna. I was wondering if I should quit or change the name of the band or something, but I just felt like I didn't. I shouldn't do that. I don't know. I just felt like I wrote these songs. And I wanted to continue on with it because we had all this momentum. And and also there was a lot of people who were who had assumed that I hadn't done any of the technical work, I guess, because I'm female. And it kind of mm. me and I felt this kind of, I felt a need to prove myself. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so I was well, like, what, which, really which, the difference. And I was yeah, like. Yeah, which must be like a true impetus though, right? <laughs> Where you're just like, fuck, fuck these people. I'm going to show you that yeah you know like i'm a huge part of this and i mean i think if, uh man if anyone's seen you play they should kind of know but you know maybe they're yeah, not but up people don't know and i mean at the time there weren't as many females in the minimal wave or electronic scene i think there's a lot more now which is amazing um but at the time it was you know Typically, if there was a female in the band, there was, like, also a guy doing a lot of the technical stuff or whatever, and I just felt like um, it was, females weren't really represented as much in the scene, and uh, I felt like, why should I quit, and, or why should I let people assume that I don't have the technical skill to continue, you know? Um, I just kind of got determined to shake that off, and... Um, yeah, I'm glad I went forward. And Hayden's doing great now. And he moved. I mean, all the projects I've been in since then have been amazing. And I'm going to death. <laughs> Just yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. I mean, which, which is great. And I think also it gave you the avenue as well. Like you said, sometimes it's true, right? Like you need to kind of be a part of both, like sort of fully flourish. And that's sort of what, I, what I've seen as well. Because sure. I, I love... The Sometimes stuff that you people are just there. alpha, and they want to have control over their creative project, and they want to do what they want. And I think that that's important. Sometimes when you're an artist and you have a strong vision, and like when you're in a band, it's really hard to get everyone to cooperate and to not have their egos dominate everything. Um, <laughs> it's hard to control your ego and know your place in a band. And sometimes people are just, you know, some people just need to be like the leaders of something. And I think I was also that kind of person. So I, I think we both just had to go do our own projects and, you know, no bad blood or anything. I, I am so proud of him. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, that's great. And it, it really worked out. Yeah, totally successful in a few different, you know, areas. And, um, yeah, and I'm very, I mean, I really loved playing with him and working with him because it was so hard for me to find anybody that I felt comfortable with that I had a chemistry with, you know, it's it's just like so rare to find people like that. And yeah, I haven't, the only other person I've been working with now is my friend Adrina, who's my violin player. Um, I've been working with her pretty much the whole time, um, but she doesn't play every show with me, but um She'll play special shows with me or, you know, we record a lot together or sometimes just come up with ideas together. And um, I've really enjoyed that a lot. I mean, yeah, just... no, I, I've noticed that too. <laughs> I was actually going to get there too, because I was like, there is a violin, there's a violin player. But um, so once you, you, you kind of parted ways with Hayden and you guys went off to do your own thing, I mean, 
I feel like a lot of stuff started happening and then, you know, Sub Rosa came out and like, it was a, a whole other kind of, I think, moment for you as well. And you started touring like kind of a lot, like going to Europe and doing these bigger tours with like, you know, um, I'm not M Marshall Cantorell and also, why am I forgetting Sean's other band? Why can't I remember it? Zeno No Glitter. <laughs> there it is. Jesus Christ. Yeah, uh, Sean and Liz and, and uh, you know, also kind of coming from the weird scene and, and stuff mm. like that. How did it feel to kind of start really expanding and touring that much more internationally? And how did, how did, was that as just like an experience from being like, hey, I'm finally getting to New York City was... and like, people are starting to understand me and being in like Moscow <laughs> with, with them. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard work. I mean, touring and carrying around all those gear is fucking difficult and expensive and just takes a lot of your physical, mental energy. But I mean, it's what I've always wanted to do. And I've always just wanted to travel, and make music. So I felt really I mean, I I felt really lucky that I've been afforded these opportunities because I know a lot of people struggle to get their music heard or anything and um, struggle to get shows. I just feel like really lucky that my shit connected with people because I was afraid to release Sub Rosa because I felt like it was weird and different than some of the other minimal wave stuff. And I felt it was a little more lush and... I wasn't sure how, if people would like go for it or, you know, if it's strayed too far of the genre. I mean, I don't give a shit now, but <laughs> at the time it was a little, I was a little self-conscious. So yeah, um, touring has been great, but it's, it's very stressful. <laughs> um, I'm just happy that it connects with people and I get to go to places like Colombia, you know, all over Europe and it's just, it's weird. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of an amazing thing that you you think that like music that you make now, it's so easy for like the other side of the world. Someone could be just like listening to your song. Yeah. That's That used to be a very difficult thing and in our technological times, that's kind of uh, an easier thing to, to kind of come by. One yeah. thing I wanted to ask you, you said that, you know, you were, a little bit self-conscious, you know, thinking a little bit about, you know, kind of genre and form and stuff like that. I think that happens to a lot of us at different times, right? You're like, oh, I think I'm this, and you build your kind of character in your mind of like what you are, and then all of a sudden you start making things that aren't quite aligned with that, and I think you have to negotiate that, those different thoughts. What, what did you do, or like, did, when you kind of finished, you know, making that piece, which, I mean, some rose that I think is phenomenal. And, and, you know, I'm on the outside looking in, what kind of got you over that? Was it other friends and confidants being like, Hey, you know, like, this is fucking great. Go for it. Or did you just sort of feel like, you know what, now's the time. Fuck it. I'm, I'm ready to, to, to make it. Yeah, I've, I've always kind of had a fuck it attitude, even, you know, you, it's easy to get self-conscious, I think, because you're just, when you're trying to play for your audiences and then you're trying to get labels interested and you're like, oh, I don't know if this label's going to like this because it doesn't, because they seem like really strict with all of their genres and then it makes you feel weird. But like, always, you know, I kind of like grew up in the night and kind of had this like, bucket attitude, like I want to be original and I don't care what other people are doing. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't like people who are just copy copycats of genres. Like I always felt like it was really important to have your own character and your own personality. And, you know, I was just like, well, fuck it. If, you know, I have, I'm really in my heart doing this because I want to do what I love. And I think other people will like it if I'm honest and passionate enough about it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, definitely. I think intention and, and having the intention come across is is always really key, right? And and just, it feels, I mean, I just listened to that and to me, I'm just like, this is just an original intention and this just feels right. Like there's nothing like forced about it or putting on airs 
or even putting on, you know, I think uh, when you get into some of these sort of darker kind of synth subgenres of industrial and post-punk and stuff like that, it can be a little cosplay sometimes. It can feel a little bit maybe artifice sometimes yeah. or the aesthetics <laughs> weigh almost too much, right? They almost weigh too much. And I'm like, yeah. All right, let's, let's bring this over here. Um, one thing that you were saying yeah. before when you were talking about kind of getting songwriting form and, and stuff kind of a little bit more refined and stuff, when did, you know, I, to me, I, when I started listening to you guys and like it was you and Hayden, so it was you guys, you know, and then it, it went, went to you, it seemed like it kind of felt like it flowed into a little bit more of like a verse chorus structure. Was that on purpose or was that just something that you were like aiming to do or did it just um, kind of happen naturally? I think I've always kind of done the sort of, you know, verse chorus structure, but you know, I, I'm really into complex things. I, I do, it's funny too, cause I like love the minimal genre, but it's easy to like be too minimal sometimes. I don't know, I need to be entertained. So I like changes and, um, you know, rather than like fluctuating between two bass lines, you know, I need more than that. So, like I like things that challenge my brain, and I think it comes from my level of classical music a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really think there was a big change between when I was writing with Hayden, and, because I was just from the seven inch to the to Sub Rosa was when the change happened, and a lot of the songs I had already written before Hayden I'd written them years prior actually um I'm kind of slow with releasing things but yeah I think I've just I've always enjoyed pop structure I also love avant-garde and like noisy shit I mean I could enjoy any of those things and I kind of I try to have I think the most important for me is having a dynamic when I write an album or a song is just um, having changes that hold your interest or tell a story, you know? Sure, yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that you point that out because for me, the chronology, you're giving us like the internal chronology, which is interesting because we just know it like this comes out, then this comes out, and therefore that's, you think how it was written and stuff, but you're saying actually this pre almost predated that and or it was the same, all the same time period. It's just really interesting to sort of, to hear that for the first time because to me i'm just like oh all right you know from the fan perspective you're like oh <laughs> it was this and then that uh speaking of you're like yeah it takes yeah. me a while to, to put you're... shit up um yeah it, it, i think I, I have a weird brain that needs hooks you know <laughs> yeah no i love hooks too i mean to me it's uh like you said i, I you know you can sort of Anything can be good if it's kind of pulled off well, or with, I think, a good intent. It's just how you do it. It could be the most minimal, like, techno song or minimal synth song. Very simple, but it just really depends on what you're after and what, what, you're, what you're really shooting for, what it is right. that you, you want out of it, right? So right. Uh, that, that sort of depends. So when did you start adding in the, the violins and stuff like that? Because I saw one performance of the violin, and it really was like, I did not expect it at all. <laughs> Uh, what it's was that sort of like? She's actually been playing with us since Hayden was playing with me. So um, we've all played together. But, you know, I just I started working with her a little more after Hayden left and recording more with her. Um, but, yeah, she's been there since the beginning. <laughs> really? I had no idea. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, she's she's interesting because she's not really hooked into the music scene and she's kind of moved around a lot. So, um yeah, we don't always work together. I kind of, I wanted to make, you know, I like being solo because it's easier. I don't have to coordinate with other people and rely on them. I don't like relying on other people because I don't, um, I just like being independent and able to be free in that. But, um, yeah, she, I mean, she just works with me whenever she has the availability, which is nice. I, I like playing with her. I actually have had two different violin players. Um, this other girl, Allison, has played on... Uh, she actually played a little bit on Subarosa, too. Um, but Adrena was, like, my first main violin player, and then 
Allison played for a couple of years. Um, yeah. Shout out to Allison. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's, that's cool. It's interesting, too, like, you know, even as being like a solo artist or whatever, it's like, you have, I feel like you, like you said, you found a community, you build a little community around the project and you have people that you ask for maybe some advice or tips or to play with you, other things like that. And you, you kind of build it around yourself um, a lot. So after Sobrosa, I mean, I feel like you've played all over the world and, and tons. Um, I know that you were kind of joking around a little bit before and saying, yeah, it takes me a while to put shit out. Uh, I gotta ask the question, is there some new music on the horizon? What are what are we what are we thinking? Yes, yes, yes. Um, well, I mean, I've been slowly working and recording. I I've actually played a bunch of new songs in my my sets over the last year or two. I've I've played a lot of new ones. Um, I released one video of a newer song. Um, but yeah, I have I have a full length coming soon it's been kind of hard to like balance work life and everything else and then the pandemic shit happened but yeah I'm, I'm working I might even do like a double album because I feel like I want to put out a lot of songs <laughs> yeah we're all locked inside might as well make some shit while we're here right um yeah. no you're totally it, we actually played a show two shows together this year which is like mm. insane as I would have thought that that would have been like the craziest thing on earth that we actually played some shows <laughs> together. Uh, but I remember, you know, you playing a couple of new tunes and I was super psyched to hear them. And I mean, I'm not, you know, we're in the interview capacity now too. So I'm not going to hound you like, hey, that was really cool. When are you going to put it out? But, uh, okay. you know, so now we, you've been slowly kind of working. And I think it's really important for people to sort of hear that too, you know, like making something really cool and being a musician, it takes time and it takes yeah. inspiration and we live lives and, you know, other things kind of get in the way. I mean, I made my, uh, you know, I did the, my EP on Synthesize last year around April and mm -hmm. I had a couple new things and then the pandemic hit and stuff like that. I'm going to finally, I'm going to release a couple songs towards the end of this year, but I mean, it really it was like, pff, they knocked all of us off track, right? So yeah. it's so to get knocked off track it really is and then like and then I spent so much time playing shows and touring and then also working a, a job and like having personal things happen and you know it's like draining and financially expensive I I mean yeah I, I'm definitely putting something out in the next you know I was I was originally planning for the end of this year and then when all this shit happened <laughs> it's like everything got complicated, but hopefully soon. Um, I don't, I don't like to set dates because I, I just stuck at, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm just sort of curious at where you're at in, yeah. the, in, this, in, the, in the process, you know? Mm. Um, just a little like update and being like, oh, that's, that's kind of cool because obviously there's just so much and especially now, it's like, who the fuck knows about pretty much anything, you know? I'm, I'm happy that we're here having this conversation. We'll start. We'll, we'll sort of stick with that. So now when, you know, I, obviously you've been writing a lot and in between touring and life and work and all this sort of balance, which is what we all sort of have to, to you know, to contend with. Um, how does kind of a Void Vision song really start to come together? How, what's your really like approach to, to, to writing? You wake up one day and you're like, I'm going to write a song. You're very <laughs> diligent. You know, I know some people who are like, I wake up and I, I try and write like, three to four times a week and they're very like on it like that some people are like i wrote a record in a week and i haven't touched my shit in eight months yeah no i'm constantly like working um i think the last couple of months i i was like really unmotivated and i felt like a lot of anxiety so it was hard for me but yeah i i pretty steadily work um i always have tunes floating in my head Thing. Um, I kind of have this practice where I always write lyrics or poetry or even if it's just like a, an exercise um, and I've done that since I was really young like 12 I, I'm just constantly writing the thoughts in my head to sort them and I think it's really good practice and I think like you need constant 
practice like that in order to, you know, make progress. But, um, yeah, I, uh, I usually just, I sit down with my shit and especially if I'm excited about a new piece of gear, I'll play with it. And then things just come to me and I don't know, there's always like tunes swirling in my head. I feel like my brain is just very, um, tuned into sounds and music like ever since i was a kid i was always humming every song i would hear on tv all the time I was constantly looping music i don't know <laughs> that drives me insane. yeah no but, i mean that's kind of yeah some people are really like that for me i kind of have a lot of phrases that i kind of hear and i mm. always like would write things down for the band just like Ooh, those words sound cool together, or I, I love that, you know? And it could be the most, just listening to the news or sports talk radio or anything, you know? And I just, <laughs> yeah, I just grab these two little pieces. And before I know it, I have this just collection of like three word, two word phrases, <laughs> titles, and I try and find the, the common threads. I think we all have little devices like that for yeah. ourselves to get it going a little bit. Yeah, and I think it's like a way when you're, going through life to try to you look for signs and symbols and the things around you and you try to make sense of your own psychology by like relating to these symbols that you see in the world you know and you're, you're like you see me I see metaphors everywhere I look so I'm always just coming up with ideas through little things that happen here and there you know Sure, yeah. Uh, do, would you say that when you're coming up with songs, are you a little bit more like like vocal melody first kind of person? Or does it really kind of come a little bit more with, mm -hmm. with kind of the production first a little bit? Like, what would you say you kind of kind of air towards? I mean, I know it's not some strict line here, but... It usually comes to me while I'm... It kind of comes at the same time, like, while I'm fucking around with you know a tune or a loop I made I'll just hear the vocals come to me and sometimes I'll have to change the lyrics but I usually will something will come to me and then I just you know I'll use like filler lyrics sometimes and then I'll refine them later but occasionally they come fully formed and I don't need to change them but that's kind of rare it's usually like mm, come up with a tune and then the vocals kind of come with that like they fit in I don't know how to explain it <laughs> but yeah I, I find yeah. myself really like inspired by the sounds themselves sometimes some sometimes it's not even melodic um it's like the tone or the texture will inspire the direction that I go in you know yeah and I think it kind of can inform like where you where you fit in or where what what kind of where where the sort of like open spaces for you, your voice to inhabit or, or something else. I mean, I've been learning a lot about that too, as far as, you know, I like kind of very heavy percussive. And for me, it's really like drums and bass. My stuff's very techno-y. So it kind of has a little bit of, of that vibe to it. But also uh, I can't pack everything down into those low frequencies all the time either. Yeah. And, just, and just finding space. And I've started singing a little bit on, on my stuff and, just finding those spaces, I always think is kind of interesting. You know, certain people where they start, like, oh, now I got to fill in these more percussive spaces here. Because, you know, some people are just melody machines. They're just like, they, mm, oh, cool. I wrote that and that's cool. And then they go the other yeah. way. I, I can't imagine that, honestly. For me, it's completely the opposite. Yeah, and I love rhythm too. I mean, I'm, I'm super into beats that are more, you know, more than just a 4-4. Four, four. I really in, think that the rhythm game is just as important as the rest of the song, and I love experimenting with that. I mean, that was one thing I also really love about Nine Inch Nails. They always had these, like, very odd rhythms going on. Or um, So, yeah, I mean, and I think, it, I think it's especially important because it really breaks up the dynamic on an album when you have, you know, it's like sometimes when you're doing a DJ set or techno set, everything can just sound the same because it's like the same beat, the same BPM. But when I'm doing an album, like I really want it to move in different directions. You know, even with my live shows too, I like 
I have a, um, like a, you know, start off with something dramatic and I kind of build it up and then break down and then have like a, you know, finale. Like, <laughs> I like that. It's exciting. And I like the albums to be dynamic in that way. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that that's really interesting too. It's cause, and that's the choice that you want to make. You're like, you know, I'm not, a, you know, a techno artist or something that's trying to inhabit that space. And a lot of people, maybe fall in the in in sort of different categories there and and for you you're like no I'm, I'm trying to make like a listening record that you can sit down you put it on and uh i'm taking you on a ride we're, we're a lot of different <laughs> moods and and kind of palettes and slow like a lot of dynamic kind of plays in there as opposed to maybe like someone like myself who's like i'm going to give you you know three to four song eps but they're going to be built for like i'm building stuff really a lot for one in the morning, you know, like, like I'm, I'm building stuff that's really a lot more dance inspired. And that's where, what I'm shooting for and the things that I'm kind of coming to. And maybe now for me too, that's changing a little bit as well too. I think as I become yeah, I think bit it, better. <laughs> it always depends, like, I mean, there's music for every purpose and mood. And like, you know, when I'm working out, I want a certain BPM and I want this, style and um and i think it's fine to to stick to that and it all just depends on what your goals are but um yeah i kind of i guess for me it was like very important for the album to be personal and i do i love the dancing shit too because i love playing that live i love how people respond to it and like i really i want an energy in my sets um but i also just really admire when an album is more than just a collection of single songs. Like I want them all to work together and more of a concept album, I guess. Like I put a lot of thought into the concepts of the album as a whole and not just individual songs. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and that's a lot of that. So. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Cause in an age of like the single or whatever, you're really sticking true to being like, I want to make albums and I want to have that depth to it. And when you get something from Void Vision, that's really where, what the unit is, you know, we're making albums and we're giving you that, which is really cool. It's, it's, a, it's a, a certain approach and it's got its, its own kind of weight and, and, and merit to that. I want to talk a little bit about the, the live show. Um, we got about 10 minutes left and obviously the live show is, is great. And for anybody, if you, you haven't had a chance to see Sherry, she'll slap up, schlep all of her synths to you uh, at a certain point when, when this shit's over. But um, it's really amazing to see one person really playing so much of the synth, singing, doing all of this stuff at the same time, really just kind of, I mean, to me, I'm, I, I sit there and I watch and I'm blown away at all of the different things that you're doing to kind of just create the show by yourself. Um, how is it kind of bringing that show together from, from that sort of perspective in terms of, okay, now, all right, I wrote all this stuff. How am I going to kind of pre present that from that point of view? Cause you're doing a lot. You're singing, you're playing bass lines, you're playing leads. I mean, Shari's out there like <laughs> doing it all. So tell, tell me how, what it's like to put a show together. Yeah, it's, it's hard, but I guess I got you to it. But um, I mean, I really like having all my gear to hide behind, I guess. But I am sometimes a little self-conscious of not being able to be more mobile and move around the stage. Because, I mean, I do, I like to entertain and stuff. And sometimes, um, like, am I being boring right now? <laughs> because I'm very uh, self-conscious. But I like having all the gear on stage because, um, you know, I show people it's live. I want to, you know, there's no laptop. Uh, I like the X factor of, well, you know, using analog gear or things that aren't functioning quite well or me being drunk uh, and fucking up or playing something different and improvising. <laughs> so I like all those X factors because it adds, it, it makes it different than just turning on a record and listening to it. And I... I always try to do the live shows as close as I can to the record, but sometimes I, I like to embellish and add in certain parts and like build them up and make them more grandiose. And 
albums because I I always enjoyed when other artists would would kind of make things even more dramatic live you know like yeah um yeah I just I want to go to a show I don't want to just listen to a record I I I want there to be a little danger or unpredictability or you know <laughs> yeah no I think that that's totally right I mean that's how you're going to see the the live show and then the presentation of these things so yeah to me I mean technically it comes up beautifully and I've sat there and I've watched that way but it's also um, the crowds having fun people are dancing people are singing along it's it's a really it's a it's a really nice show but it's also just so uh I mean I just you're by yourself and you're pulling off so much so I'm just was like okay <laughs> every moment you're you're doing something there's no like moment of rest or anything like if it's happening you're really in control of it all yes yeah, it's, it's exhausting I actually tend to I usually go into kind of a trance when I play and sometimes I can't even remember it because <laughs> um, it's, I mean, sometimes you can see the audience, sometimes you can't at all because the lights are blinding. Um, I like, sometimes I look down too much at what I'm doing, but I always, and more recently have been just trying to connect more directly to people because I really like the direct connection of like when I look up and I see someone and they're like mouthing words to me and that's really special and I like those moments um but yeah I, I agree with you about kind of the going blank sort of thing too mm -hmm. I think a lot of the best shows that I've ever played um whether it be confines or like playing in bands which you know and, and singing and stuff like that is the shows that uh, it's almost like you get like a runner's high or something and yeah. then like, like you're not thinking about shit you're just doing and then at the end it's almost like you woke up or something like you, you passed out and you're like huh and and people are like yeah, that was sick or like yeah, that was really fun or or you felt it but I only got a couple of snapshots you're not in your head when you're in your head those are like the worst shows am I yeah. that, aren't those yeah. the worst shows yeah, truly. <laughs> no, I, I like being in this state of mind. And especially because I think I have to do that because I'm a little um, self-hating or self-conscious. So I kind of have to separate myself from myself and, um, you know, just put myself in it emotionally and passionately because I think if you're scrutinizing yourself too much and every little thing you're doing you're not really focusing on being honest and giving an honest performance you know and um, yeah you just have to like remove yourself a little bit <laughs> absolutely I, I, I think it's really true it's like we're going we're, we're just like losing it for a second and that's like a very beautiful uh, thing as far as yeah. you know, you presenting yourself live too. That's obviously just from the sort of the the aesthetic, the physical aesthetic too. It's like that's grown a lot as well to the point where now you know you you kind of have like a void vision with the the face jewelry and like certain things of that nature, which has become kind of uh, a bit signature, which I think is fucking great. And and how did that sort of come to sort of be the thing that you inhabited? Obviously, that's very purposeful. I'm not sure if you're walking in the streets of, of Philly rocking that all the time, but <laughs> how, how did that kind of come to pass and, and what made you want to kind of bring those aesthetics to um, Yeah, I've really just, I mean, I've always been a crafty person who likes making shit. And, um, but I think I've just, I've found, I used to hate fashion when I was younger because I just thought it was shallow, um, which is funny because... <laughs> I don't know. Now I find it very empowering. And I feel like, you know, if you dress a certain part, you get treated differently and it creates a character. And I just, I like theatricality. I like when, you know, people are paying money to see you and you want to put on a performance. And I think creating these characters is interesting because um, it adds to the story I'm telling. Um, even if there's no direct relationship, it, you know, it can cause you to feel an emotion just by, you know, having the right atmosphere, having the right outfit, whatever. I, I think it's important. And, you know, I know some people kind of rebel against it and they, there's a lot of, you know, like, oh, fuck, 
dressing up or even trying or whatever, I, <laughs> which I get. But I don't know. I've just, I feel like the character helps me become someone else on stage and it helps me tell stories better. and it gives people an excitement. So I like it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that that's really well said too, because you, of course you're you're not doing these things to be you know disingenuous. You're doing them to inhabit like maybe something else, so you can be like a higher part of the art, right? And like people yeah. who've been doing that for however long, you know, David Bowie, like just go back, right? And like in especially yeah. in the synth genres as well, especially you know, it's always been sort of part and parcel of what. It kind of has attracted, I think, a lot of us into it, you know? I mean, we saw how Robert Smith looked like in his first music video with like the really short hair and stuff like that. And you're like, who the fuck is that? You know, like, um, like I, 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 I remember when my friend first showed me that, I was like, that's Robert Smith? What the fuck, you know? <laughs> I could almost not imagine you're like, that person inhabited that thing and that became yeah. a much bigger sort of entity, which I always think is, it's something really interesting and I saw you sort of approaching that um, sort of status within like your own work where I'm like, oh, she's putting on like the, the battle armor, you know, and now we're going to go out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've always like felt like the person I am on stage is a little bit different than who I am off stage. It's not that it's not me, but um, I always kind of feel like there's certain things I don't wear when I'm on stage, certain things I do. And those are all part of this other person's personality, the stage person. And um, yeah, it's just interesting how different people treat you depending on how you're dressed or, you know, they they won't respect you if you, you know, it is shallow. People are shallow. They judge on visuals. And I think it's an important part of conveying what, you know, what you want to convey visually. It, Anything visual, whether it's music videos or, you know, what you're wearing is a part of the music performance and your message. <laughs> Absolutely. It becomes that way, whether you want it or not. You know, if you're trying to do it in sort of the negative, it becomes a sort of a counter aesthetic anyway. So no matter what, people are going, you're, if, as long as you go step out on a stage, uh, you're there to be judged anyway, in a way. So, or yeah. maybe to be good or to entertain or whatever have you. But that'll uh, definitely be a part of it. So we got just like another minute left. I just want to say thanks so much, Sherry, for coming on, sharing this. And, you know, thanks for sharing. I mean, probably the only show I'm going to play this year uh, was with you. And that was such a beautiful time. And I hold it, now I hold it like dear into my fucking heart too. Like 2020 is the year of our show with Contra Boy. Don't mind. Um, so that thank you so much. It was so nice having you here. <laughs> yeah, those shows were incredible. Uh, and they were great. And I was so looking forward to keep building off of that. And I think I could say for everybody uh, watching and, and checking this out, we're all looking forward to music whenever it comes. Stay patient, people. Great things take time, all right? Thank you it's so true. much, Sharon. <laughs> Thank care you. yourself, be well, and hopefully we can see each other uh, after all this bullshit's done, all right? Thank you so much. Take care. Ciao.